Hello, everyone. This is um, Yi Fong, and I'm on with uh, my co-host, Lily. Hello. Hello there. Uh, welcome to Watching Silent Films Podcast. I don't know if we officially put that as part of our name, Watching Silent Film Podcast, or just simply Watching Silent Films. Either way, <laughs> our goal um, week to week is that we would pick a, uh, a movie that's rela- related to silent film era or movies of that time or something related to silent film era watch it and simply talk about it and so that's what we're going to do this week um it's a little bit unique and different because it's a a documentary about a filmmaker about the first filmmaker perhaps one of the first filmmakers who was highly influential and uh basically history forgot just because she was a woman so um the documentary is called be natural the untold story of alice guy boucher and it's directed by Pamela Green. And uh, what was, was it, 2018? Or was it 2019? I know it was made in the last couple of uh, years. 2019, it said. Yeah, but, but when they actually made, when she actually made this movie, it was 2018. Hmm. Uh, it only started to show in the festivals in 2018, and it slowly got picked up uh, by distribution for a nationwide release uh, around 2019. But it's been in the festivals since uh, 2018, so she's probably been making this for a couple of years, even before that. I would, I would say. So, um, it is a 2018-2019 uh, documentary behind the scenes, essentially, about this uh, filmmaker who was a woman, who is a woman, was a woman. She's passed away now, but uh, who was born late uh, 1800s, and essentially. Uh, is the mother of the film industry <laughs> that we know mm-hmm. of today, and that um, I I I normally for movies like this, I would like to simply do like a spoiler uh, section towards the end, where like if you do in the beginning would we'll talk about it in, in general terms, but not spoil the movie. But since this whole movie is so encompassing and so much details that uh, we're not going to do that today. But normally. We would, what we would do is like, oh, yeah, we'll just talk about it in a non-spoiler form. and then, But with a documentary, it's really hard to do that. Do it that way. <laughs> like if you're watching like uh, The Sixth Sense, right? Then you want to like, oh, well, well, you know, make sure that the ending is not given away. Well, if you were talking about it when it was new. So does that make sense? We're, so we're not going to have any spoilers. Um, you would want to have already seen this movie. Um, but we're going to talk about her life because you can also just find out about her life by reading about it on Wikipedia and also uh, literature that you can get your hands on, especially after this uh, documentary was uh, it, uh, debuted and came out. And it, it just it's it, it. There's so much more interest about this person's life now after this documentary than before. And so that's that's why I just want to, you know, make sure that. We don't have any spoiler alert or not spoiler. We we'll just go for it. You know what I mean? Mm. But before we get there, we're going to have a very brief segment on sort of uh, kind of experimenting of uh, what what have you seen lately? Uh, and it doesn't have to be exactly silent films, but something just uh, more classic era is, is like, or like to put it. Anything that you've uh, been watching lately is of interest to you? Just, uh, I was watching the original Bewitched series uh, starring Elizabeth Montgomery. Uh, I had learned that they had filmed on location in Salem, Massachusetts for a lot of the episodes. And I believe in the early 2000s, they released her statue in the center of Salem Common. Oh, excuse me, not the Salem Common, but off of Washington Street. So there's a nice statue of her there. Um Because I work in Salem, so I I wanted to know what the show was really about. And it's very of its time. I think it premiered in 1964, also starring Agnes Moorhead and Dick York. And it's very cute. I I liked it. Uh, Some things aren't so, uh, you know, as a being a woman myself, uh, you know, it's just like, oh, the husband telling her, go make my dinner. (laughs) Just kind of like, ah, okay. (laughs) But... That's you know, it's a product of its, time. of its times. For yeah. Sure. Uh, again, this is one of the things that we we talked about in the very beginning of the first episode of the the podcast series is that 
it, you gotta take everything in context. You know, whether it's silent movies Definitely. or Bewitched, these these sort of um, what may be classics now. Even if we if you look back on it, and even um, what we the Birth of the Nation, for example, you always have to look at those works in the context of their times, and. That's not to to say that you want to make excuses for them, obviously, but it's more just like you have to figure out like why why did they do it that way? You know what I mean? And once you do, it makes more sense as you're watching it back because that's kind of, you know, that's part of our history. Unfortunately, is that during the era of time, men and women and how their relationships are in the family, that's how they kind of treat each other. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> good, bad, and different. It's like, you know, that's an in entertainment often reflects the realities of people's lives. You know what I mean? It, it can hold up as a mirror to some of the histories of of uh, people's lives and how they relate to each other. Yes. So. But, yeah, so that's all I've seen as of lately. Um, how about you? How, anything interesting? Well, I was doing some uh, reorganizing my base. I have like a... How I watch some of these movies is I have a 100-inch uh, front screen projector, you know, 7.1 surround sound. Of course, the silent movies I'm watching is in mono a lot of times. <laughs> mm-hmm. So anyways, <laughs> like not color, black and white, and not in the widescreen. But uh, the benefit is that sometimes when I... Uh, anyway, so I've been reorganizing, and I happen to stop by this movie called City Girl by F.W. Murnau. And I just like, oh, man, I got to just test this out. And I put the disc in and, you know, I, I have all these uh, technology of like, you know, I have a 3D Blu-ray so you can watch 3D movies with glasses at home, just like you do in the movie theaters. And and they're really nice and really, you know, I, you know, I'm kind of like a, I like all sorts of things, right? A variety of things. But it, it, and it was great, like 3D movies. But then when I popped in a black and white movie. You know, I can stop a lot of those 3D movies. I can stop the color movies. I can stop the modern movies. I'm like, I don't have time for all this. I got to move on. But man, I put on like City Girl and it was restored like uh, by uh, what's that? Masters of Cinema and Eureka. It's a label just like Criterion on the on the U.S. side. Um, this label is a boutique label that releases uh, classics just like this. And when I put this on and I'm watching it, um, pretty soon, like, I watched, like, wherever I started from. I zipped around. And it's just, I can't stop it, you know, some of these classic films because it's so innovative. Like, the mov- the modern movies I look at, I'm just like, okay, I got no time for this. I got to move on. <laughs> you know what I mean? But, uh, it, you know, movies like that on S- City Girl, it's just... Just looking at it, just the visual, the I think we talked about the nitrate and how it gives it a, a glow uh, yes. or a just transparent and very just luminous, you know. And that's why, you know, we'll often refer to Hollywood as stars or luminaries. Like all those descriptions, actually, I would bet some a lot of that comes from the fact that the film itself, through the lens, which is the glass itself, also it captures some of that light. And this film, especially in so many instances, the light and and dark and the interplay of that, it's incredible. I, I hope that we'll get to review that in the future because uh, F.W. Murano, it's got to be the one of my favorite silent film directors, if not just the general director in general. He's just the incredible, incredible talent. Anyways, that's what I... Uh, watch in part i didn't watch the whole thing but certainly more than half of it <laughs> more than i can say to any of the other modern movies but yeah it's just incredible and what's incredible is just like sort of the, the way the, the screen is framed um the way the characters are and how some of them are already acting in their own method even before modern brenda came along and i don't know it, it, it is something to love about those movies especially from a master like if they were most known for is uh nosferatu that's his big uh movie that everybody references back to um especially around halloween 
Mm. So it's like the rich, not the, but it's one of the big like, oh, it's a vampire movie. You know, you heard of that at least. Everybody is. Yeah. Sort of as soon as that. you said Myrna, I was like, give me direct Nosferatu. He did. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, he, That's the only one seen. I associate him with. But that was only one of his like about I think nineteen movies he made. Um a big chunk of which is lost. I think we 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 might only have about half, less than half of it left. Mm. Which is sad. But anyways, so that's what I watched recently. That had been just incredible, you know. Anyways. That's what I watched recently. <laughs> Alright. Um anything else that you've seen recently? more over the classic era i know nothing nothing too recently just youtube videos but eh, we can ignore those <laughs> so let's move on to be natural the untold story of alice Guy Boucher. um what is your initial impression of this movie this documentary right? uh my initial at least at the very end i felt so endeared to alice Guy Boucher at the end of the movie i was almost like down on the verge of tears at some point, but I felt so much, I was emotionally invested into this documentary. That's how much I appreciated it, learning from it. Uh, it was, it was a beautiful story. And, it, you know, like a lot of people's lives in real life, it, they have tragic parts to it, but that's what draws you into the discovery of such a, an amazing person. So I, I want to read the, biographies about her the books i would love to actually own the film well the uh, autobiography bio- yes. she's got she wrote her own and it was mm-hmm. posthumously published which is sad but yeah i know that broke my heart too what no one wanted to publish her works i'm just like how <laughs> it's a you know such a slap in the face of course you know when we were talking about context you know of everything of its time they're like oh you know a woman's voice has you know, no, not as much meaning as it does now. So, but I thought it was an amazing and very well done film. It definitely deserved, I, on the Canopy website, it said it had two nominations at the Cannes Film Festival. Uh, I'm sure it said, it would have said if she won any awards for it, but I'm just wondering, you know, what stood in its place to win. <laughs> Well, I mean, there's a lot of competition out there. And uh, also, oh, yeah. I think, again, just to, just the notion of the topic alone, it's so, um, I don't know what the word is, but maybe disturbing, maybe, or maybe not disturbing, but sort of disruptive is might, might be a closer word I'm thinking of. Because, like, sh- she herself, the subject uh, of the document, Alice Keep, was ignored, right? Mm-hmm. But even now, the documentary about her story is still ignored. <laughs> it's yeah. kind of sad that way, you know? It really is. Like, even though her life and what she has uh, contributed massively to the dawn of cinema, uh, like, the amount of things that she contributed it deserves this and more and all the praise and honor that she is due. But then this documentary in of itself, I feel like in, in the, in sort of in the grand scheme of things is also ignored because people don't want to be reminded that they're wrong. Right. Mm-hmm. Like if you look at all the film history and like that, I think that's part of the documentary is in the middle is like yes. all these film, you know, you know, uh, historians, how do they write the historian the the history books of film or film history is that they hear about it second hand they n- you know didn't go to the primary resource which is the way you're supposed to do uh a proper history book i mean if you can is if especially if you're contemporaries of the the people that which you're writing about for hip film history especially film history you would go to the person and ask about it from them and write it in well the film history you know authors they often didn't do that they would simply hear it from oh i I thought somebody said and they write it down as as fact they would cite a second hand source rather than the original you know 
not heard from a rumor of the, the direct resource. And again, that's why that uh, Kevin Brownlow book is amazing because he, he physically like met with all these silent film, at, you know, stars or, you know, filmmakers from the early era and wrote the book based on primary research. Right. Mm. But actually even his book, uh, Alice Key Plays Shea wasn't a huge, huge, she was kind of was talked about for sure. Well, it wasn't like it wasn't as, uh, you know, uh, big of a t- context even back then, because I'm sure like he himself was when he was researching and reading, probably didn't have all this material that we have today, I think, slowly uncover in time. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah, so that, that was very like my reaction as well. My first impressions is that at the end, I, I not only teared up, I broke up and like ball like a little baby <laughs> <laughs> and the reason is because in the beginning of the movie uh when she was making all these movies she left the kid her kids kid or kid maybe one or two her her child child or children they like she left them behind with uh the grandma and made these movies it's one of those like life work balances uh as a mother and i see that like in my wife too is like it's a challenging choice how do you care for your children and still sort of work uh and provide for the family in some ways but also follow a passion uh for something that you love doing uh as a work but also just like you know be a mother and take care of it's just an astonishing choice that uh she made the choice to say, I need to get this, you know, thing going, this art moving forward. And in some ways, these films, these you know, hundreds, shorts, and if not more, thousands of films, I think, uh, were her children. And the fact that at, at the end, she tried to, it's almost like all her children got adopted, uh, into, went into foster homes, these films, you know what I mean? Mm. and she couldn't get them back and that's why i cried like a little baby at the end because you know i'm a dad myself and i can't imagine my kids doing that (laughs) and like she herself like these were almost like her children and and uh and even though you know she did spend a, a big chunk of her you know towards the end of her life caring for her you know uh kids and growing them up and all that stuff but but the fact that like her other children were are these films and they had got lost and she tried to reclaim them and she couldn't and she died like heartbroken being not reunited with these films which were her children and that was why i broke down because it was like it was so sad it was like and and then she died and she when she tried to write about this as an autobiography nobody would publish it so it was sad it was frustrating it was just like uh amazing you know, and also the amount of people that uh, Pam Green got to interview for this sort of documentary—it was amazing, right? You had like yeah, huge amount of people. I mean, I didn't even think about Adam Sandberg was gonna be on. I was like, what? <laughs> I, was like, I know. Learning Grr. even that Gina Davis had a company, I was in, I was in, intrigued by that too. I was like, you know, the little bio. I was like, huh? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So yeah, it. It was so eye-opening and amazing, and I already knew about this because of uh, another podcast from Nitroville talking about just uh, early um, filmmakers. And I think one of the podcasts did interview Pamela Green, which I heard too. It was amazing what she was doing. But also, like the uh, there was another set from Kino. They released a Blu-ray of, including Alice Kipchoge, but also like Lois Weber and a whole bunch of early silent film uh, women. Uh, filmmakers it's astonishing that uh back then prior to 1920s and 10s it was probably like it's got to be something like either a third or half of the filmmaking industry was by women and part of the reason that they wanted to do that was because they wanted to legitimize film as a a serious medium and that can only happen if women get involved (laughs) it's very true i loved it i loved it and um yeah, instead of just like this very niche thing, um, that's that's why they did. and because the audiences they want the audiences all to be diverse too. It wasn't just all males watching these movies, and so Universal probably had the most uh, amount of work 
women working for them. But anyways, long story short, uh, that era of time came to an end in the 20s because Wall Street started to notice that this film industry was uh, taking off and was making a lot of money. And they're like, hey, I want a piece of this pie. And they are the ones that corporatized the film industry. You know what I mean? Mm. And that's when they, that. they bought out everything. And at the end of that, it was like, well, that's the end of that. And that it wasn't just Alec, but it was like everyone got just sort of sidelined after that, which was very sad. But and I think it's one of the topics that they talk about in the documentary. It's like, why isn't it that way today? Like you talk about, you know, equal sort of rights. They were already doing it in the dawn of cinema. But now today, I mean, you look at the statistics in, in the filmmaking industry. It's like a, a fraction of what it was. It's nowhere near as a third or 50 percent of the entire filmmaking output. You know what I mean? Yes. And so that's what I love about this, this documentary. It really peeled off something. It's just like an amazing thing. So what do you think about the uh, the early part of her life, where she grew up, where she was? I mean, she's French. Yeah, very fascinating life. Uh, you know, four other siblings, one died. I can't exactly remember what the disease was uh, out of pox. Chile. Chicken pox. Yeah. At, and then, you know, it said her mother wanted at least one of her children to be French. I got that offline. That wasn't from the film. But, you know, she grew up in a little bit in France, and then her grandmother took care of her, and then eventually she went back to Chile, where her father eventually died, it said, of unknown causes. But, you know, just like, you know, back and forth traveling, so I can see how she would want to do travel shoots as well for her career, because there's so many different ways to see life. But uh, her seeing the Lumieres first premiered their film with Leon Gaumont, which I learned a lot about him as well, was pretty... uh, It was really interesting because that's the driving force to her that was like, I can make something out of this instead of, you know, just these boring clips. Exactly. And we've seen some of those, remember? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of these, exactly, yeah. So we know exactly what she's <laughs> talking about, you know. But we, I, th- I think we also did see that Cabbage sort of uh, kid thing. That's the, one of the shorts she directed. Instead of just uh, pointing at camera and just at some sort of... Like that one from, uh, is it Denmark or Dutch or something? Where it's just people on the bridge. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's from like... The eye restored it. The... <sighs> what did the... Yeah, the bridge. Yeah, <laughs> essentially that's what name. it was. And... and, and you know, there wasn't really a story. It was more just another uh, doc, like just like a webcam. Slice of life, yeah. It's a slice of life. It's almost like a webcam we have these days of like, you know, pigeons on top of high rises. <laughs> so like that's, I think, was Andy Samberg's point in this document was like back then they were doing stuff that we do now. Like today we have all these like we have so many cameras we don't even know what to do with. And they're literally pointing and installing it in random places. And you can like tune in to stream it anytime you want right so you know what i'm talking about yeah. right? so they have like that's webcams on top too. of buildings and they're looking at pigeons whatever it is on top of the buildings and like that's just like still like that's still life that's like a you know you can you can peer in to to, to somebody's you know existence through the camera that way and that's what they're doing in the beginning they're experimenting again and part of the experience was stuff like the the, the bridge shots and stuff like that but what uh Alice Kibiju, and artists like her in the beginning was like let's have a story behind it and that's, I think, her big contribution was that in leaving the Lumiere event in 1895, which um, George Melio was at also, if you recall, back in the uh, A Trip to the Moon podcast, was this. This seems to be a very seminal event uh, for a lot of filmmakers in the sense that they finally demonstrated that you could film something and project it. And that was a, a kickoff, you know, for the rest of the film industry after that time. Which is much earlier than anybody thought of, you know what I mean? Yeah. But anyways, what, so what do you think about just that whole part of in the beginning, just, you know, 
she kind of told some of the backstories of how Alice grew up and how it, she kind of moved around and, you know, how that contributed towards her films later on. We actually haven't seen a lot of her films yet. But um, first of all, there aren't many around anyways. But uh, uh, of the ones I've seen myself, they're usually really rich with all sorts of topics and subjects that you don't normally see of films from even that era. So she was, I think, was a pioneer of uh, experimenting uh, with storytelling. So other filmmakers, right, they were experimenting too with how to shoot still life, um, just, you know, day-to-day sort of almost, you know, documentary-like things. But then, like, the the way she's incorporating as well as many of the artists and contemporaries were, were trying to tell a story, but the way she tells the story is a series of experiments, you know, like everyone else was doing. So Mm -hmm. that's quite powerful. I think. What do you think of that story where after she started working for the, the Gaumont company, and of course she's in the stereotypical role of the secretary. (laughs) Mm. And, uh, And then what happened after that? Like when he, when she talked to, uh, you know, the, the stakeholder or manager who eventually became the owner of the company, uh, the Gaumont guy, Leon Gaumont, I think. Yeah. And she was like, well, what about this? You know, I can do the secretary, but well, what about doing this? Like doing like actual filmmaking, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I was just like going over my notes. Sorry. I was trying to like listen to you and focus on that too. <laughs> and I'm just, uh, you know, she, just on a note, she, you know, proved everyone wrong with a stereotype wouldn't, couldn't do it and they wouldn't do it. So, you know, she was a stenographer, which is, I think was the early version of a typewriter. So she could be their secretary, but you know, it's, she... uh, it's like the, it's a stenographer, which is like, if you go to court, they still have it today where you have to type and down, you have to write down every word that you have to do in court. So like Ooh. if you're in court, like somebody has to write down every every sentence that every word that everybody says. Yeah. So it's like a record. And so uh, I just got Jerry Dewey as I remember that. So there's a person <laughs> there that will actually write down everything that you say. So if you're in if the court is in session. So that's the stenographer, but it's not the typewriter isn't the way that you see in like a QWERTY keyboard, it's like a really messed up thing. Cause I had a friend who, who became one and they're like, it's not a regular type. Like it's like a weird comment. You, you can Google it, but it's a, it, it, you have to be trained as one. It's very unique. Anyways, go on. <laughs> Sorry. Side note. <laughs> no, that's okay. But you know, I had gotten that note from the film and I just, you know, I wrote it down cause Alice was just like, I don't know. I thought she was a, like a badass lady. <laughs> That's for sure. Uh, so I was just trying to think back to the company. And, you know, she couldn't get the job. And then, but I think it was. Oh, gosh. What was his name? You know, Leon Gaumont, the, the, the manager? I think it was Felix Max Richard. Okay. And then who told her to go see Gaumont. And oh right, yeah. He 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 hired her to work for a manufacturing supply as a secretary, and then that company uh, eventually changed hands. Was sold to the um, the company that eventually Gaumont was at. Yeah. So it was sold off to another company, something like Eiffel or something. Because, yeah. And then so. afterwards, Gaumont became sort of the major. Uh, force of filmmaking in France. But part of that is because Alex E. Boucher took the technology that Lumiere brother pioneered like in 1895 and started to make movies, uh, you know, along with other people in the company. So that's the, that's, I think was the amazing part. She took what was normally a role that like when she got a job, she couldn't really, get into and barely got by but then she took the opportunity that was given her and made something for herself i think that was part of the story that i I liked the most 
mm. is that it, she could have just been a secretary and kind of, uh, you know, take no action and just kind of just be that way. But when she saw the technology demonstrated in 1895, she started to scheme and think of ways to make use of this under the, you know, eventually what Guman would own in that company and make all of these, you know, shorts and movies. I mean, that's pretty amazing. You know, she's yeah, got the, really the, the, the smarts, the talent, to, to, and also a visionary to see the future of what this could be and kind of just experiment with things. And the fact that this guy who, you know, allowed her to experiment. I mean, that was also nice of him to do that. You know what I mean? To give opportunities yeah. to do that without saying, well, you're just a secretary. You know, what, what do you got to contribute to? But I think he saw the opportunity in there because, you know, ultimately it's about money, right? I yes. think, I think that eventually it made money. And then, you know, that's where, I think what's excellent about Alice, too, is that she, it even said it in the film, she was a shrewd businesswoman, but, you know, she was a businesswoman first, then an artist. A lot of times people think that, oh, I need to make my art and film, when really, yeah, you can, but do you know how to sell yourself? And that's why a lot of people seem to fail in the industry, because they're not business people. So I think one reason why she was so successful is she already had the, the skills underneath her belt. So then she could go make her films and be like, I know what I'm doing. Shut up. <laughs> because what's, she what's amazing about that? Mm. She was doing that at the same time. Yeah. Because she didn't come from like, a, you know, 21 years being on earth of in business. I mean, she was only 21 in the, in the start of the secretary career. But, you know, by the time she got involved with making these movies, she was also simultaneously developing and getting experience on how to run a business. And that was, to me, astonishing is like, you know, she's like multitasking. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and, and one of the big key things, and I don't remember if it was mentioned in the uh, documentary or not, but I know that if you read some of her, her background in history, she probably was one of the only ones making movies after the Lumiere debut from like, you know, 18, what, 95, 96, all the way through the... You know, think think it said to 1906, about 10 years. Yeah, exactly. It was it was uh, quite an amazing thing that, again, like I feel like she's kind of the mother of cinema, right? <laughs> so yeah. many people attribute this to like you know Griffith and other people like Méliès and uh, Edward Porter, and, it, it, Edison and well, yeah, yeah. And, and a whole host of other guys. When the reality is. Especially if you look at the um, early uh, uh, women filmmakers uh, uh, set, it, it was so much more than that. It, it was such a, a diverse group of people, and uh, I don't know. I just felt that it was amazing. It, it's kind of truly a, a lost history. It's untapped, and uh, somebody, uh, this Pamela Green, uh, uncovered it, which was amazing. And a little bit of background on Pamela Green: she is. She works in the film industry. It's not very clear in the documentary itself, but if you look up, look her name up, she's done titles sequences for movies like uh, the what's it called, The Kingdom. Uh, what's the most well known one? Wolverine, The Wolverine, for example, hmm. or uh, The Muppets, The Cabin in the Woods, some of the Twilight. So, so all these movies, you know, in the movies nowadays, they have like title sequences, right? Where yeah. you see the logo, but then like, which I think is part of it. Basically, all the stuff before the first shot of the movie comes along, with the logo, the titles, the the music, the the the, the sometimes they'll have graphics, you know, running along. So all those title sequences um, with the visual effects and the graphics, like that's what it does. That's what she does for jobs. So with that background, she has that's why she has access to, access to some of these uh, interviewers because <laughs> she is in the industry. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. anyway, a little background on her. And uh, so she, you know that she's part of the the sort of maybe not like in the foreground, but certainly very uh, popular, I think, uh, with with her uh, career. But yeah, I mean, this took her a long time because she started in uh, 2012 to try to work on it. 
ever since probably before that technically but that's when she she uh started in earnest and you know who 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 is there by her side to help her i mean not like side by side but something that somebody who would push her is robert redford right the guy who's behind the Sundance, as well as many other things in his life. Another Everybody. famous actor, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, filmmaker, right, in general. So he's done a lot of things in his life. He's retired now, but he he used he helped uh, independent movies a lot uh, in, in his uh, post uh, sort of fame, more famous acting uh, careers. But anyways, long story short, that's when they use Kickstarter and stuff like that to get money for to fund the documentary and stuff like that. And some of that is like, you know, in, in, in the movie, you see some of the um, graphics or the sequences and, and shows you like where she is in the world, like that sequence. Yeah, the beginning sequence traveling. was exactly. gorgeous. As well as like when once she went to Fort Lee in New Jersey, like when she built her uh, Solax studio, right around the corner was like the big, you know, Paramount Fox and all these people. Like having that graphics to me was like mind blowing because it truly helped sell the idea that she was right there all along yeah like really right did. next to them all of them the, the the big studios and like she was just one person <laughs> mm. that was astonishing but so what do you what do you think about that sort of p- period of time in the, in the beginning of that documentary after that after she was given the okay to start experimenting shooting things after that guman guy was like oh go ahead just do your thing they're making money. Um, what's the best way to say it? Um, well, because of all of her experimentation, you know, she became, I mean, she was a director. She became one of the, the starting screenwriters, producer. She became a studio head and the owner of Solax. So from there, she earned all these credits. Um, because of her work as well, she was able to distribute domestically and internationally color films and the black and white versions as well. Uh, what else can I say? Uh, she, I mean, she won a collaboration award in 1900 for her at the at Paris Exposition. And then I, I'm sorry. I'm just trying to go over my oh, no notes worries. to see what sounds great. Yeah. Well, so what well, I think what 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 was interesting to me was that um, you know she, she, you you had this guy who owns a studio with giving her paying her the you know uh, the ability to make more money with the films that she's making, but also that she was allowed to experiment. So she was armed with all this technology, all this support, you know. All just making a living, but also like the ability to distribute some of this. And so it's amazing what some of this encouragement, some basic backgrounds would allowed her to capture so many different things over time. I mean, the, the breadth and, and the depth, maybe not the depth, but the breadth, the, the quantity of the, the things that she captured in the beginning that we can't see because they're all gone mostly. Like a, a small fraction, a handful of her, her films. Uh, you know, exists that we know of today. But by and large, most of her stuff is largely gone. <laughs> mm. um, I think the largest, the, the big thing that really uh, made her name, well, sh- her first narrative, arguably, is the uh, the Cabbage Fair, which we saw a few uh, podcasts ago. That's the thing where, you know, you're finding these uh, babies under cabbages, and which is, a, again, a, a common mythology of or her context and her time and her culture. And that's kind of her claim to fame in the beginning in 1896. But it's mind blowing, right? 1896. It's just mm. it's something that came out with with that amount of uh, just detail and, and characteristics and themes. Uh, after that, then she start when she's able to. Then she started to do more dance and travel films and stuff like that. But I think after that era of time for work for Goman, she made this movie called the life of christ which is like a basically a adaptation of a little book that it was very popular in uh, france at that time with a lot of illustrations and some of those illustrations very much look like those uh, renaissance paintings of like the figure of you know christ and the christ story and stuff like that 
and she literally took the the screens almost like comic books as uh production drawings or something what do you call that the storyboards for her yes storyboards exactly and then she shot it basically on top of that so see she didn't do like an adaptation from the bible but rather it's a very uh impressionistic because she she's more adapting that work that you know would have been in families especially if you're catholic uh in 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 france and and it's just very popular sort of work um at that time the artwork um, it's not really like a coffee table book, but it's just something that's seminal, very popular back in the day. And so to do that as film, and I think she experimented with uh, audio recording, just like that, um, the jujitsu uh, sound recording. I think that was her too. Yeah, Levere Jiu-Jitsu. Exactly. So it was r- roughly the same era er- of time too. She was experimenting with that. The difference with her technology, and th- and that's the other thing, like, Special effects, you know, uh, the speed going back, forwards, and forwards, special effects, sound, right? In 1906, again, astonishing, right? She would rec- pre-record it and then uh, synchronize the pre-recorded sound with the film and then record that again with the footage that she's shooting. Yeah, with the chronophone. I yeah. thought that was really fascinating. And then they cap- they happened to capture her directing with that device next to her as well. Right. So That's I thought that really was a great visual as well. Yeah, and I think that is available. Maybe not the full cut, but like at least half of that footage. So if if we can get our hands on it, we'd be able to watch it. Probably on YouTube somewhere. But somebody may have restored it. I could have sworn. But we'll look at that later. But the Solak studio that you're talking about came a little later when he when she eventually got married to uh, Herbert uh, Blachet, which is then the change of Alice Guy Dash Blachet, and that's where the name got changed. And when she got married, I think he got a job or something uh, in, uh, was it New York or somewhere, or Chicago, to, to try to sell something? What was that? Yes, I think it was Gaumont had companies in America, and they were going to work and sell the products over there. That's right. He's is, this is like a salesperson essentially over there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In which they eventually stayed and had she had her daughter Simone. I think she was the firstborn. Right. But uh, it didn't turn out though. Whatever they were trying to sell, and eventually they kind of just stayed there, you know, in uh, New York. In the area, yeah. And then eventually, um, she built the studio in Fort Lee, New Jersey. So that's pretty cool. It's very impressive. I it's it's yeah, <laughs> it's all just so amazing. Yeah, and all of which is before, you know, the nineteen twenties, again, when when the big big Wall Street companies uh, corporatize the filmmaking industry. But uh, imagine, if you will, like before that time, here's this independent uh studio owner, uh filmmaker, uh sole distributor and artist uh, for the Solax studio, right? Right next to all these big shots, <laughs> 20th century and all mm. that stuff, making these incredible movies, right? Like, just by themselves. It's just mind-boggling that that was happening um, right then and there. So, unfortunately, we, we won't be able to see a lot of these films. It sounds like there's so many uh, good material uh, of our filmography that uh, essentially we wouldn't be able to see, you know. So it's largely lost. Um, anyway, so moving on, um, after, uh, you know, she ran into some pro- personal problems and got divorced uh, from her husband. And after that, she effectively, I think, had to take care of um, her kids. And eventually that's, I think, what, closed off the studios and stuff like that you know what i mean yeah cause she eventually moved back to france as well yeah and attempted so. to break back into the industry and then you know they were rejecting her after that which was sad mm. and then part of soul i think it's a part of solax was on fire too so they had lost part of the company which oh yeah is awful. that too that's right yeah 
but yeah, I mean, uh, a series of things like that, uh, you know, cause it. So both history itself, meaning, you know, when Wall Street swooped in and corporatized uh, filmmaking uh, studios and the industry as a whole, and on top of that, her personal sort of uh, economic troubles and sort of, sort of uh, personal marriages and all that stuff, it, you know. She eventually just, you know, we're like, well, we're done with this. And she just sold off her uh, studios, you know, by the 1920s or something. Mm. Filed for bankruptcy, divorce, and then returned to France and never made a film, which was sad. So even back then. And then, uh, but yeah, so afterwards, uh, I think s- uh, a lot of people, I think it was even a documentary, tried to talk about her and, and talk to her rather and try to find out where some of her films are and she herself also tried to track them down to no avail you know what i mean people just didn't care which was sad so. yeah because at one point point i think she s- was able to get a copy of one of her films from a film historian and but he's like oh you can borrow it but i want it back you know it's just <laughs> like <laughs> like wow <laughs> yep that's that's the uh that's unfortunate but what I also liked about this f- movie too is that it was part, you know, a detective film because right. a lot, you know, for her relatives and I, I think it's at her first cameraman, uh, Pim or Pin, you know, his granddaughters, and then they had all this information and pictures. It was just impressive to find out it was all dispersed all over the country. Um, the the woman had to go to somewhere in Arizona to oh, get oh yeah all this. To somebody's garage yeah it's yeah. all in everything it was like everything is hiding somewhere in the world maybe not all of it was destroyed during the war when they needed all the extra parts right so yeah there was know. like a it's there was like a it. I think the original camera she had used they tried to reconstruct that right and to make a movie out of the parts of a camera that was constructed mm. for use for Solax films and stuff like that. So that was uh, pretty interesting. But yeah, I mean, they had this uh, scene where they went to this street or some location of sh- where she was shooting in France with those... Uh, uh, oh, yeah, her... that part was really great. Yeah, and it was about one of the... What was it? The bed rolling down or something? The and... drunken bed, I think it was. Yeah, and also... mattress, that's what it was called. Yeah, and also <laughs> one of them was on wheels. It was so creative. Like, it was just mind-boggling. You know what I mean? Yeah. So... And then the stairs, the four-year-old heroine, I think that was, where right. she stopped a, a robbery. And it's, you know, all these real places... You know, the stairs are still there. <laughs> Not that the stairs would be destroyed, but yeah. you never know because of the war. Yeah, and and I think one of the things that uh, I, I now just remember was there was a film she made called Fooling His Money. It was one of the first to, again, first is hard to say, but probably the first to have all, all uh, African-American casts. It was, you know. Especially after we watched um, Birth of a Nation. Yeah. This one seems to have a, uh, a decent story, not a one that was sort of, you know, racist in nature. <laughs> yeah. But it was more just had actual story line that made use of the cast. So I thought that was pretty interesting. That she was yes. so open minded uh, that, you know, she would be able to sort of, I think the plot is something like, uh, it, it's about sort of uh, the, the I th- class. I think, th- yeah, I think yeah. the man won some money and then he's flaunting it all to show off to his friends. Exactly. And then he ends up losing his money and then his friends once again. <laughs> yep. Yeah, so it, it, it's just amazing and uh, the amount of uh, contribution that she made. But you know, again, I just, it's so unfortunate that. Uh, you know, she never uh, got the, the 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 accolades or acclaim that she does desperately deserves. I think, but also that it's mostly gone. We can't even see most of her output. It's literally, you know, you can count on two hands maybe the amount of material. 
that is available, which is sad. So yeah, and it's one of those stories where you're like, is this handful of films representative of her talent? Which it might be. We haven't seen it yet. Um, most of them, or is it just like a, a slice of what? There's so much more of. The one I'm most interested in this is this Life of Christ, which is uh, the reviews have said it. The uh, the way she frames the movie is is pretty amazing because it's trying to sort of match some of these paintings that is in that book. Mm. So I, I I definitely looking forward to to catch that once we get get around to it. <laughs> Yeah, I would like to see it. I'd like to see a lot of her films if we can. Yeah, I think some of it is available um, through that collection, certainly, the early women filmmakers. But then, like, the rest is more like hodgepodge. you got to figure out from the film studio, uh, the film festivals, or maybe just whoever put it up on uh, YouTube. So probably YouTube is probably um, the one that is uh, the easiest to access some of her uh catalogs but ocean wave or is it wave ocean wave i think it was the ocean wave yeah that one is uh very widely uh, available i think mm. so. yep 1916 towards the end of her illustrious career but, um... all right did you have anything else any final impressions I got a. L- I wrote down a lot of nice quotes from the film as well that I might as well share them. Why not? And what is this one? There is nothing connected with the staging of a motion picture that a woman cannot do as easily as a man, as there is no reason why she cannot completely master every technology of the art. And it was just another one of those where talk. You know, we're talking about her being the mother of film. You know, she she just could she could do it all. You know, especially f- for the time. It's just it's nice to hear, no matter what era you live in, that you know a woman can do it. It's not just a man's world. So I just wanted to share that. And despite all the odds that you know she thought of something, she was going to do it, and she she did. And another thing that I got from her. It said uh, from some uh, an interview from 1957, you know, when, kind of what we were talking about. When people critique the first films, um, it breaks her heart because, you know, it only shows the conditions they made the films in. Because it, we don't know the struggle that the directors had to deal with. The camera breaking down because the technology is so new. They don't know what to do. Or, you know, getting, you know, not that having the budget not having the right weather conditions, just all these things, you know, and then, you know, someone from our generation is just like, oh, this film's crap, <laughs> you know, come from 1900 because we don't understand anything or all the effort that went into it. Not even including that, oh, there's no sound, if, you know, if that makes sense. So it's just another one of those. I I love our podcast because I'm learning and gaining such an appreciation for this generation of early cinema. Yeah. And that's why I, I think I pointed out very early on, which is it, it's my favorite era. It, it's mm. because people, uh, I mean, it, with every era of filmmakers, you know, even after this, uh, after the talkies came along in the forties and f- the golden age of what I like to call the golden age of cinema. I think some people re- reference it as that, uh, as well as like the 50s, 60s, it, every era of filmmaking they all work really hard. Even like the crappiest movies that we watch today, like Adam Sandler movies, you think they're just like, ah, oh, nobody wants to watch those. But you know what? Like if you look at some of the Adam Sandler uh, interviews, they they work their butts off. I mean, even though it's not like, you know, Oscar winning or, you yeah. know, a critically acclaimed movie, it still employs hundreds of people very often. And he's you know? one of the highest paid actors, too. Well, I yeah, heard that nowadays. on the radio. I was yeah. impressed. The, I was like, the, wow. <laughs> the point is, every era has their struggles when they make movies in it. It does make you appreciate that. But I think the early filmmakers didn't have any reference points. Like now, in the uh, even the talkies, the 20s, 30s, and all those era, era of filmmakers, 
they at least could look back and say, oh, those guys, silent film era, like, we've evolved so much. You know what I mean? Mm. And after the corporatization happened of the 1920s and after, the industry started to break down the actual roles, their actual job when you're on the, the filmmaking sets. Now that we have, like, instead of cameramen, they have, like, director of photography and directors and all, like... The, the tasks and duties of a job of filmmakers started to be chopped up more. Whereas prior to that, nobody had labels. I mean, you know, everyone Alice, had a hand in everything. Exactly. Like she probably like held a camera. There was no union rules <laughs> saying that she couldn't. There's all these different things. that was just like everybody just contributed everything into it so that this movie could be made. And that to me was is and, and everybody. So they could MacGyver everything, you know, into existence out of nothing whereas before there was there was no reference point you know what i mean and that's what i love mm-hmm. about that era of films because it, like how could you have created this when you had nothing else to reference back on you know like for example when we get to metropolis same exact thing like how did this guy created this all this massive just you know sets and different ideas when he had nothing else prior to this essentially to go on you know what i mean so mm. it's the same thing with her and all her work, you know, how does she come up with these ideas? And it's just, it, it's just amazing to me that, uh, that they're able to do that. And as well as just create new techniques, you know, like what if we just zoomed in on people, <laughs> you know, what if we used, you know, instead of blackface, real, you know, African-American real cast people. And, <laughs> yeah. And like stuff like that. It's just astonishing. They didn't, they didn't have these limits of like, oh, we can't do that. They're just like, let's do it. See what happens. You know, yeah, it. it was very, you know? why not? Yeah. So I really love that aspect. The just sort of the the gung-ho nature of all the filmmakers in the beginning to do whatever it took um, to make these movies come along. And, and actually to a fault because sometimes people died. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, as we'll get to some of the ugh. Douglas Fairbanks stuff, where they all dared each other, and then like some people actually died because they were trying to impress, you know, movies and stuff like that. But then that's where, as with these deaths, it's like these these workers started to have these rules. That's where these rules started to come along. Is because it it was because people died and gave their lives essentially, and now. Like there are all these rules in place or you can or can't do certain things, you know, just protect protecting people, you know, for the sake of movies. You still have to be safe, you know. As with any job, I would hope <laughs> that's well, that that's how it is. Remember that manufacturing silent film with uh, mm-hmm. what's that company? Westinghouse. Yes, the Westinghouse. Yeah. Company. Uh, and my comment about how, like, of course, back Nothing's then. safe. Yeah. And then. <laughs> you got to think how many people die to have a railing in front of some of those thing foundry things where you can fall in. You know what I mean? And they mm. didn't have any of those. <laughs> so that was interesting. But yeah, I mean, you did bring up something that as you're reading that, that we don't have to spend too much time on, but uh, as a woman, you can represent all women from all, all time, past, present, and future. I'm just kidding. Um, I, I thought that it was interesting that, you know, the industry filmmaking industry back then compared to the industry now like i think they made some comments in the in the documentary as well what do you think about the the representation as it were today even versus back then like the filmmaking now in 2019 as we're recording um, i guess thinking about the film itself um the we're talking when alice gibelche was talking about what, I think she was talking to the historian that they uh, about like ten. She was among ten female directors. I don't know their names besides Alice Weber, but she was telling him about them. And I don't think anyone had done as much as her. And to be honest, I really don't know the percentages of women filmmakers today. But you. You can't think of any offhand besides, you know, Patty Jenkins because of Wonder Woman. She's she is the only female filmmaker I can think of at this time. Of course, they mentioned some during the documentary. Oh, Ava DuVarney, that's another one. But I can't think of any other women female women women filmmakers 
that are currently working, even though I know they are. It's just they're not well known about. The narrator, Jodie Foster, is actually and, a director yeah. as well. So she's director. Oh, uh, there you go. There's another one. Yeah. She did uh, something recent about a hotel. What was that? I forgot the I name know. of it now. But it was about this uh, hitman. So if you're a hitman and you need to go to a hospital, you can't go to the hospital. So Jodie Foster, she, she directed, but she also played a role in it where she's like this doctor that runs an illegal hotel or not hotel, but a hospital. So Hitman, like if you. Oh, if you I think a, I have seen that. Yeah. So or that's I her, hadn't that's seen Jody it, Foster. but I've heard of it. I saw the commercials. Yeah, exactly. Mm. So she's still like making movies like that. But so like, again, right? Like you're absolutely right. The amount of uh, female representation in filmmaking from uh the the actors are pretty even, I think. Actors and actresses are generally pretty balanced, right? Yeah. In front of the camera. So we're talking specifically, should, I should have clarified the question more, but we're talking more of just behind the camera, right? Like the the production side of things. Uh, not just directors, but also like f- director of photography, the DP cinematographers, uh, film composers, and uh, so forth and so on. So that, I think is where like it's the percentage is like it's it's abysmal i think compared to back then because think about it composers like re- i just randomly picked one but like how many female composers can you think of off the None. top of your head exactly like we know like the john williams you know the danny elfman's and you know, Alexander these, Desplat, yeah. Yeah, and like Jerry Goldsmith, and these older ones. But like any no there's so many out there. But then it's like, oh but 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 what about women composers? Oh well I don't know. I mean there's a handful I know. maybe. Well there's uh, <laughs> yeah, there's exactly it's a handful and yeah. maybe they're obscure because you just don't know their work. Exactly. And uh that's the thing about like we're just starting to trend some of that stuff now best especially after the me too and all that stuff movement right mm-hmm. like what was that um captain marvel and i gotta look this up because i don't know her name but that's the one with a female composer for a superhero movie right oh. so that was pretty cool because i think they want to try to intentionally do that maybe maybe for marketing purposes i don't know that's a, probably that's the conspiracy theorist in me but anyways mm-hmm. so be that as a may uh, it was still a woman so that was cool and so those are the things I'm thinking of. Um, animation might have a better representation in some ways. I'm thinking like Pixar. If you go into Pixar, it's probably going to be like half and half. Just because of the nature of Pixar. But Pixar is a little bit unique because it, you know, it the, the movies they make, but also the culture that they built is more like a, like a startup company. You know what I mean? Yeah. So Pixar has been evolving since the first Toy Story. Yeah. So so that's kind of unique. But other than things like that, I would say by and large, it's 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 kind of you know it's definitely not fifty fifty. It's not even like seventy uh, percent men and thirty percent women. It's like fractions probably. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so mm-hmm. that's where we are today. Sadly, it's so funny that like, um, who was it? I think it may have been mentioned in the document. Maybe not. I can't remember now. Maybe I heard it from somewhere else. But some of these topics too, um, that these women filmmakers were tackling, the films, like they can't even be made today, <laughs> let alone back mm. then, and they made it. Um, I I think there was one. Maybe not by Alice Guy Boucher, but like there was a, uh, I can't remember now, but there was this Lois Webber maybe, or maybe somebody else making a, 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 a short movie about abortion. Oh yeah. I think I remember them talking about that. Exactly. They, well, I don't know if they made it, but I think she wanted to make it for, it wasn't Planned Parenthood, but just for the pill back in the early 1900s. But the woman who was in charge of it, she got arrested that day it opened. But I, I can't remember exactly if they made something for it or she didn't get a chance to. And But the woman ended up getting, you know, taken in by the cops regardless. So it was right. kind of just like, oh, 
But ex- uh, talking, jumping off of that too, you're right because in another early film of Bleche, she depicted a woman being pregnant, and they said that wasn't a thing back then. Um, and that was just, I think she was one of the few directors that actually showed a, a woman with a belly even before she had any babies. I, Cause I guess that was too lewd. <laughs> you know, I'm not really sure. <laughs> yeah. It's that's, that's what it turns into. It becomes these ridiculous rules of like, Oh, what you can or can't show and stuff like that. And this is all before the, that, um, the code, right. You know about the code, the Hayes code. Uh, I don't think I do. Oh, that's like, um, so, around the late 30s i want to say or maybe by the 30s i can't remember the details but after the talk has came along um there is this panel of people most of which is influenced heavily by the catholics i think or the whatever you want to call it they they have to approve a movie before it gets released in the public and they're kind of the evolution oh the ratings it, okay yeah not the ratings but uh, not quite yet <laughs> it, they, a board that's made of uh, people who think that certain topics or certain scenes or certain ways to show movies are too lewd. That's what it is. Um, mm. And so that's what's called the Hayes Code. You can research it uh, later. But so, for example, like if you do you remember the movie It Happened One Night? I think I've heard of it. So movies like that. There was a scene in the movie where the girl hiked up her you know, still stalking to hitch, like, uh, to hail a, a taxi or car or, no, they were hitchhiking. That's what it was. And so the guy with the thumb couldn't hitchhike, hitchhike anything. It's Gary Gable. I forgot the woman's name, but, but she hiked her skirt and she was able to get a car. And so a scene like that is too risque. You know what I mean? And so the Hayes Code, the board would say, oh, you can't do stuff like that. You know what I mean? So they're, they have the power to, to tell to the, say yay or nay exactly hmm. and so there'd be movies where you just can't show it and then they're done the movie's done they, they can't show it that's the Hayes code so before that came along um there are these sort of you know best practice i guess and that falls into what you were just talking about where you know you can't show when pregnant or because where would that come from unless they're a family like there's all these you know ridiculous rules about yeah. what you can or can't show you know but yeah, filmmakers like her and and Lois Weber and many others, they often will pursue these more social, serious topics in their films. You know what I mean? And it's so funny to see that they already made those back then, even prior to the code pe- coming into existence. Because you can never make those movies after the code came along. They they would just simply say, "This is way too controversial. Abortion, <laughs> forget it." You know what I mean? Yeah, How do you even be talking it. about that? <laughs> like in that era of time. Um, but so like even today though if you fast forward to today like universal wouldn't even green light those that's that, i think that's the notion that people are talking about is that you have these movies dealing with like you know uh you know families where the kids are in foster homes and or poor people they can't even get food on their tables and you know abortion and, like these serious topics <laughs> you can't even get that green lit um like with uh, women filmmakers, you know what I mean? Mm. Well, anybody, really. So these are the topics that these women filmmakers wanted to focus on and tell stories on the screen, you know? And it makes it all that more fascinating, too, because, you know, they because of, they kind of had free reign before then, too. They, you know, they just did it. No need to worry about repercussions. They're just like, doing it. <laughs> Yeah, they wouldn't know if uh, if they were showing this somewhere and people don't like it. Um, the uh, like if they if let's say you had this uh, uh, film that was uh, sort of controversial or could be potentially, what they would do is they you know let's say you have a, you have a popular movie, silent film, and you send it to various different towns uh, across the country, and um, like if you sent it to a small town in Oklahoma and that small town didn't like what you're saying. I forgot what they did, but they would like destroy the film somehow and write a letter or a note back saying, no, nope, we're not going to show this. But also you lost money in that print that you made for oh that location gosh. or that cinema. 
and that's how you can tell when things are too controversial <laughs> mm. <laughs> but that's that's kind of life it was back then you know that it, it's kind of a it's self-policed i think a little bit self-censored before it became official as the Hayes code where then the government got involved and and you know that the Hayes code was a response to you know is the government going to start regulating these movies or is the industry themselves going to do it and so it was a it was a, a compromise of a mixture it was a industry appointed board that would uh it's kind of like lobbyists right that they would talk to government people and soothe their um fears so that there wouldn't be actual laws in uh, government actual government groups overseeing this whether so it would be a self uh policing for our own industry and that's that's the forefather or grandfather of the the rating board that we know now today which is more i want to say 70s 80s sometime way after possibly there's a evolution of that but anyways so uh, anything else related to be natural the documentary um uh, i guess just the title itself you know just thinking back to the film and how back then people were posing f like they would pose for pictures for their movies when they said you know she had the big title card and the post not quite a poster but the word be natural and it i don't know just that phrase is almost very calming to think about too you know don't have to you don't have to worry about trying to be something you're not you can be it you know just be natural it sounds very oh you know woo woo and kind of silly but it's t uh, to me as an actor you know you know when you're doing either stage performance or being on screen it to be natural is just very it's it's it is a calming idea because you don't have to try to force yourself to do the best job of you know portraying this character you know you can naturally work your way into it and you know you don't have to try to worry about being fake is what i'm saying obviously because you know you're natural but the, i don't know i just from the acting standpoint i really like that phrase i kind of want to put it on my own wall <laughs> but i think it was just it was a perfect title for this film yeah, it was very because, inspiring. Yeah, she she was an inspiring woman, and that is exactly how she was. She was naturally who she was. Right. All right, well, I think that's about as much as I have for this film. Uh, and uh, unless you have anything else to add? Um, I'll add the book that the film was based off of. It was from Allison McMahon, I believe. Alice Guy Blachet, Lost Visionary of the Cinema. Um, I wrote it down at the end from the end credits. So it's this is a book I want to look up because I would love to learn even more about her if I can. Yeah, and don't forget her own uh, autobiography as well. I think you can Google whatever the title that is. But she wrote before she died. She worked on it for quite a long time, I think. And it would be interesting to read... Again, I'm not a big reader myself, but it, it again it did uh, pique my interest in seeing what she wrote of our home about her own life, about the dawn of cinema. I mean, who else better to document it than yes, the person exactly. that essentially trailblazed that stuff? So that to me got got me interested in seeing you know figuring out if they have a English translation. I I, I gotta think she wrote it in French. I was her. wondering that myself. I really hope there is an English edition. Yeah, I'm going to Google around for it. But um, yeah, uh, it makes me interested to find out more about this groundbreaking uh, person. But also am very interested in seeing what she actually made or what we can have get our hands on um, to watch. And uh, I don't think I've seen any of her stuff because even when I was dabbling in film history in the early 2000s, Nobody mentioned her. It was just not a blip on anybody's radar. Hmm. But of course, hopefully we're now wiser. And uh, filmmakers like her are now being honored uh, into the position that should they should be in. You know, like the that the start of filmmaking isn't with men, but with but with women. Like how powerful is that? Right. So at least to me. <laughs> I think so, too. Yeah. All right. 
Cool. So that concludes our podcast for this week. Um, and uh, the best way to find our past recordings, as well as any of the materials or links that we have discussed on this podcast or any other previous podcasts, is found in watching silent films dot wordpress dot com again it's watching silent film plural dot wordpress dot com and with that we will sign off and uh thank you lily once again and thank you thank listeners you. yes thank you fun and uh one last thing is that uh if you find if you found us through uh apple's uh podcast platform or stitcher or soundcloud or google or what whichever platform you found us through uh, hopefully you'll be able to uh, write a rating on there or you can do a, a quick rating, but also the best way is to write a review of our podcast so that like-minded people uh, who love silent films and loves to watch it and talk about it would be able to find us as well. And so once again, thank you listeners and thank you once again, Lily, and we'll see you again in the near future.